Welcome back. In the last three videos, we have seen our three constituent parts of logic. The semantics, which models the real world and gives meaning to the syntax. And also the deductive system, which allows us to reason rigorously about the logic and about the real world. In this video, we're going to be looking at some key properties that we would like our logics to have. And to start off with, we're going to be looking at a little more detail at one of the concepts we saw in the last video. This concept is called syntactic entailment. We didn't call it that in the last video, but we did see it. It's this notion that if we have a proposition A, in our case in propositional logic, but really this can relate to any logic, if we have a proposition A, we can find a proof tree for it. And if we can find a valid proof tree for it, we say that under, well, no assumptions in this case, we have syntactic entailment or syntactic consequence. They mean the same thing and are represented by this turnstile symbol. And in the last video, we saw how the rules that comprise these proof trees are inspired by the semantics and effectively implement the semantics. And we claimed that if we could construct a proof tree, if we have syntactic entailment, then our proposition A is true in the semantics. With more complicated logics though, this relationship is not as obvious and we need to be really careful in claiming this. And in order to reason more thoroughly about these issues, we also want a notion of semantic entailment or semantic consequence. This is written really uh, similarly using another turnstile symbol, the double turnstile. And what does it mean? Well, if we have semantic entailment, it simply means that our proposition A is true in the semantics, is true under any interpretation. So if we have symbols P, Q, R, any other symbols, we can enumerate their true and falsehood values. And if under any of those interpretations, or rather all of those interpretations, A evaluates to true, then we have semantic entailment. And sure, we may have assumptions in both syntactic and semantic entailment. We saw that last video with gamma. But really, when we're trying to prove a theorem, we have no prior assumptions, no interpretation, no model. And we can express the relationship of proof and semantic entailment with two particular properties. That we would like to hold. And the first of these is called soundness. So our logic is sound if when we can show something is true via a proof tree, when we construct a proof tree which leads to syntactic entailment, then that proposition is also true in the semantics. It is also valid. This is the key property that we want our logic to have. If we don't have this property, our logic is basically useless. Because if we show something is true, if we prove it is true, and it turns out not to be, then we've defeated the point of having a logic in the first place. The converse property is known as completeness. And this means that if something is true in the semantics, if we have a proposition that is true in real life, then we can show it is true using the syntax. This is a very desirable property for logics to have, but it's often the more complicated one. And indeed, many logics are not complete. So on this notion of completeness, what we have just seen, this is exactly the same thing. If we have semantic entailment, then we have syntactic entailment. This is called semantic completeness. And most of the time when we refer to completeness of a logic, 
we're talking about this notion. There is another notion known as syntactic completeness, which is subtly different. And this says, well, if we have a proposition A, we can either prove or refute A. We can either show that A is true using our deductive system, or we can show that not A is true. We've actually already seen that propositional logic is not syntactically complete, although it is semantically complete. Everything that's true in the semantics of propositional logic we can show is true. But let's think about a sentence comprising solely the symbol P. This sentence is not syntactically complete because P may be 1 or 0 under some interpretation. And so without any prior assumptions, we can't show it to be either true or not true. And under these kind of logics, actually, we expect syntactic incompleteness. This isn't a bad thing. Under other logics, however, we do not want syntactic incompleteness. We want to be able to show that a proposition is either true or it is false. Think about arithmetic, for example. And by arithmetic, really, we mean we want to reason about numbers and adding them together and multiplying them together. Integers. We really want to be able to show that every proposition, every formula in arithmetic is either true or false. And this leads us on to something known as Gödel's incompleteness theorem. We'll spend the next few minutes on this. And in particular, we're going to look at four properties that a logic may have. We've already seen one of them, in fact. The first is a common one, and it's called consistency. And it's saying that we, in our logic, we don't want to be able to prove both A and not A. It turns out that if we do have a logic that allows us to do this, then we can prove absolutely anything. Any sentence is true, even the sentence, for example, in propositional logic, F, which is obviously zero under the semantics. So consistency is definitely a property that we want our logic to have. Another slightly more esoteric property is known as effective axiomatization. And if our logic is effectively axiomatizable, basically all that means is that for any sentence we can write in our syntax, we can tell whether it is an axiom in our deductive system or it is not. And this is a useful property to have, so we want our, our logics to exhibit this. A third property is what we've just talked about, the ability to be able to express arithmetic to a certain level. I'm not going into too much detail on these things because that's not the point of these videos. I'm simply introducing them as concepts. Propositional logic, for example, is not rich enough to express arithmetic. And the fourth and final property we have already seen is that the logic is syntactically complete. We can show for every sentence either that it holds or its negation holds. And Gödel's incompleteness theorem says that a logic which exhibits these first three properties, consistency, effective axiomatization, and the ability to express arithmetic, to a fairly low level, to be honest, can not be syntactically complete. So any usefully consistent logic, if our logic isn't consistent, it's not particularly useful, with effective axiomatization and which is sufficiently powerful, will have sentences which we cannot prove to be either true or not true. And if we expect our logic to be able to do this, if we expect that each sentence in the logic which is true in the semantics is also true in the syntax, 
then we end up in a situation where there are some true sentences, some true statements, which we cannot prove. And this was a huge result in the field of logic. So in this video, we have looked primarily at the notions of soundness and semantic completeness. And these are the two most important notions which you should remember going forward. We've also taken a very, very brief overview at Gödel's incompleteness theorem for interest. And in the next video, we're going to be looking at some examples to see why logic is useful for us.